Ripley Osborne, on the other hand, if he no, was here sir. in person, he is in tremendous shape. He is, uh, according to his Wikipedia page, is an American football player who attended the University of Pittsburgh and played in the National Football League, World League, and Arena Football League. He's worked in the NFL as a scout, color analyst, and executive in the medical device industry. And he joins us now on the Sports Bash. And you can listen to his Inside the Birds podcast along with Jeff Mosher, who was here earlier, and Adam Kaplan. How did I do? Whoa, holy mackerel. I, I, I think that you are uh, – I think that's a home run. Um, <laughs> yes, uh, that was pretty good. <laughs> You've done it all, man. I don't, know, I don't know about the I don't know about the in shape part, but uh, everything else was good. Well, next I said if you were sitting yeah, here more with so us, than us, you would put us two to shame. But uh, yeah. you're in shape. We are just a shape. A shape. That's right. And <laughs> shape is not a good one. Um, so I, I, I want to. You know, it's great to pick your brain on these type of stories that come out on on the games and behind the scenes. And Jeff was here earlier as a reporter, kind of giving us the inside scoop on how the reporter would go about that Carson Wentz story. You were a player in the locker room, you know, and when you hear, like, the anonymous source or, you know, that there might be some guys in the locker room, as a guy who played and you read a story like that, I love to kind of hear what your insight would be because some people, you know, some of the people coming out are the captains and the high-end players, the, the stars of the team. But you as a guy who was, you know, a, kind of a guy who was on the bottom of the roster, a special teams guy, you know, fighting your way. Some people just assume, well, maybe it's a guy who just, you know, is, uh, isn't really significant on the team in terms of he's a practice squad player or a guy who got cut. But have you ever been in a situation like this where a story like this came out and everyone in the locker room is kind of like, hmm, who could be the guy? Or do you think the people in that locker room know who the guys are? Whoa. Well, I think when something comes out like that, you know, you'll have a group of people that it, it, it is kind of crazy because as, as you get older, you realize sometimes what you may look at being one way and it's like, it's so clear to you, but to that person, you know, uh, to nine people, the sky is blue, but to one person it's red and they're going to tell you it's red and they're convinced that it's red. There's nothing you can do. It's going to convince them otherwise. And it, it, it's crazy when you understand that people's perspective can change on things depending on what it is. And in this situation right here, I guarantee you there's people in the locker room that are like, that's, that's baloney. This is just somebody trying to, you know, make something out of nothing. But there's other people that are saying, oh, yeah, you know what? It, it, it does. There is that. There is people. And then there are other people who are saying, I feel that way. <laughs> and and bodies haven't said it yet. So there's definitely people trying to think of who – the potential sources are, and there's also people that probably say, I know who it could be if it was that. If they did something, I know who it is. And that's where the problems start. Now, if you're Carson Wentz, do you go and try to find that out? Or do you act like this thing wasn't even written? Um, you're probably better off to act like it wasn't written. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of tough to... It's kind of tough just to ignore something like this. Right. But, you know, it seemed like a lot of the people jumped up and said, you know, that this is baloney, nobody said it. But, you know, it does got to make you wonder. I mean, did you guys hear the story the other night about how Tom Brady that supposedly walked into the, you know, Chiefs or yes. the facility of them and said, I'm the baddest, you know what, on this planet? And, you know, people were like, you know, people killed him for that. And other people were like, yeah, he did say it. It's just... Did he say it? Did he say it? And laughing. So in this situation here, you got to think to yourself, you know, what were the sources? I even saw the guy, Joe, the interview, and he said uh, to the interviewer that people were happy that he did this because they wanted it to come out a long time ago. So if you're Carson, it's got to, you know, you want to just try and blow it off and say it doesn't matter, but he's human. And you want to be liked. You definitely want to be liked. And you want to be liked by your teammates. So there's no doubt that he's going to have it play in his mind. But how much effect it has on him or the locker room, uh, that probably is going to be minimal. Billy, you mentioned something that kind of perked my ears up. So let's say there's a guy who's a little disgruntled and he goes to a reporter and says, you know, it's not the offensive coordinator who's the problem. It's number 11. Okay, now the reporter says, whoa, because a, a, a ri according to the editor we had on yesterday, he said the origin of the story was this guy said he wanted to do a piece on Mike Groh, the offensive coordinator, as to why the offense was struggling. 
he asked a player, and the player said, well, it's not grow. He's not the problem. It's number 11. And then that made the reporter kind of say, hmm, let me ask somebody else. You as a player, do you say, hey, a reporter asked me something about grow, and I told him it was Wentz. That's the problem. Do other guys say, well, I want to talk to this guy. Like, I want to get it off my chest, too. This story, like, has that happened in the past? You mean when there's a, when there's a story comes out, does somebody come in and say, hey, listen, you know, I, I, I want to be interviewing this because this is the way I feel. Right, I like, I want to get my, I want to get my, get it off my chest, too, because I'm unhappy. Now, don't use my name, but I'm going right. to give you what you want. Yeah, of course. There's people that do that all the time to try and, you know, start stuff or go off the record, especially as, you know, depending on who you are, you definitely get relationships with some of the, you know, the reporters. So, yeah, you definitely, um, especially if you don't like a guy, but it, it just seems to me like everybody liked Carson. So it just seemed like this story is, and I think this is why it's, this is why it kind of shocked everybody because it got legs because who, who it is. I mean, it's Carson. Nobody, you know, if anything, everybody thinks Carson is the most genuine nicest uh, giving person that you could possibly have, you know, as a, as a teammate. And this is why it's so shocking. Do you think that there could be any element, I guess the perception, the outside perception is there's jealousy from Carson of, of Nick Foles success. And that's what stemmed from this people reacting to that. But when you look at specifically the on the field issues that were mentioned in this report, like, hey, Carson's throwing to Zach Ertz all the time and Nick Foles isn't as much. Being in the locker room, playing this game at the high level that you did, do you think that there could be not necessarily jealousy of Nick Foles, but of Zach Ertz from receivers, from running backs, from guys who could be getting the football instead of Ertz? Absolutely. There's no doubt about it. You're just human. And, you know, when you look at plays, uh, every receiver thinks that they're open. And it's just a matter of how you disperse the football and what you feel comfortable with. Some people have to throw to color. Other people, when I mean by color, I mean the color jersey. Like, right. you know, they have to see color before they throw it. Other people will throw to a spot because they trust that the guy is going to come out of his break and be where he's at. And that's, you know, he's very confident in that. So it just depends on – and a lot of times people, every, especially young quarterbacks, feel more comfortable throwing the ball over the middle than throwing the ball to the outside. It's not easy to throw the ball to the outside, especially in the National Football League. So most young guys feel more comfortable throwing the ball in front of them to the receiver, either a, either a crossing route or a tight end or a running back. It's just natural. And the fact is, Zach Ertz is a very good receiver, and he's got some chemistry. So we've seen that, whether it's Zach or there's other tandems out there that they have good chemistry with, and you do kind of look for that guy. And I think when you're that, when, if you're not that guy, you want to be that guy. So, of course, you're going to say, hey, you know, I'm open. And depending on who you are, you could start some dissension in that locker room on that team. Uh, Billy Osborne is with us here on the Boardwalk Honda Hotline. Of course, uh, was a scout in the league, played in the league, a uh, radio analyst for college football at Pitt. Um, so obviously you have a, a wide variety of ways to read this and look at this and see it and consume it. When you read the article and heard about it, did you look at it and say, whoa, this is pretty inflammatory, this is a character assassination, or did you say, eh, just another locker room story, no, no, no surprise? Um, no, my first thought was, whoa. I mean, uh, are, is, is this really – did this really happen? Did this really come out about uh, Carson Wentz? I mean, it, it definitely shocked me. And what shocked me even more was the comment when I looked at the interview of the guy Joe Sagliano when I looked at his um, – what, what he <laughs> Santa said. Santa I mean, me, <laughs> Joe's uh, Joe Laquito. Is that what you said? Santa exactly. Laquita. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hmm. Uh, when I saw the interview, I was – I got to tell you, I was a little bit um, – Chuck, because he was very adamant that this happened and said some things, and he actually said some different things, too, if you saw it. So to me, it was a little bit, um, it was a little bit shocking, I will say. I, it, it, did, it, did, it did take me by, it did take me by uh, surprise, for sure. If you're Doug Peterson and you wake up, this thing comes out, what are the first three calls you make? Um, to your PR guy? And then, you know, find out, you know, who this person is, you know, why it was said, you know, if that, if there's any truth to it. And then, um, 
you know, maybe you do call Carson up, or maybe yeah. you do call a couple of your coaches and just say, listen, you know, I don't know what's your thoughts. You know, just see how he feels. I mean, uh, because this, as a head coach, the last thing you want to do is have people saying negative things about your quarterback. I mean, Carson's getting beaten up, and he hasn't even played in the last month or so. <laughs> you know, it's amazing how many faults that people have found that a guy hasn't even strapped it on. So, um, yeah, I think that I think that knowing Doug, he probably did give him a call and said something and just asked him how he was feeling. That's my guess. Mm. Um, you know, moving forward from this, um, do you think Carson can go back in that locker room and feel like he's the guy, or do you think there needs to be some sort of, I don't know, re? Uh, I don't say re um, freshman orientation. Yeah, like to see walk back and... in and feel like which one of these guys in this room is the guy. Like, isn't that like inevitable that that's going to in enter into his mind? Um, yeah. I mean, I think he does have to do something that's going to. Um, he, he's all. He was already going to have to do it because of who you know what. How great his you know. Let's face it. Nick played tremendous, and he did a tremendous job bringing him back. So, uh, But I think Carson is so talented. I think he has such respect in the locker. Now, people are going to be jealous. Like, I, I heard some of the defensive linemen kind of say some jealous stuff because of Fletcher Cox's um, contract. So there is going to be some type of – and there's always going to be, I guess, what's the word now, Michael, uh, the word haters. You know, there's mm. haters out there. And when you're the national, when you're a National Football League quarterback, you're always going to have people saying things about you. And even Carson Wentz, as good a guy as he is, and I think that in this situation here, because Nick played so well, um, there is some questions about you know how is he going to be able to handle this. However, he's such a good guy, he's so well liked. I think it'll be much easier for him if he just comes out and just is himself, and just goes out there and competes, and he goes out there and wins everything will take care of himself. He doesn't want to be – he wants to be authentic, and I think that's why people love him. Do you think that there is – I guess it could work one of two ways, Billy, and you would know better than the two of us here, but this comes out in the off season. The season for the Eagles is essentially over. They don't have – Carson Wentz doesn't have the opportunity to go back into that locker room next week and win a football game or look good in a preseason game and say, you know, th come on, things are overblown. There's a lot of time from right now until the team takes the field, even in the summer, getting ready for camp and OTAs. It, it, does that work against him in the sense of, man, I need to get out there and, and set it straight by doing something, by action? Or is it enough time that by two weeks from now we'll be talking about Jimmy Butler and something like that and probably forget this? Well, you know, the, the, the news cycle is always interesting, whether it's politics or sports or what have you. But, um, and I guess for us, because we live in this town, it's gonna, you know, we're going to have a little bit more interest in this story. It does help if you're playing and you're out there and you can do things and, you know, uh, you, you know you're always good as your last game. So if you're doing stuff, you know, that story becomes, you know, you know gone in the past because there's something else to talk about. So with them not playing – there's not really much to talk about with the Eagles except something like that. So I think that, you know, people are going to be looking for things to bring topics up for, you know, sports radio, sports talk, you know, uh, TV shows. So for us, I think because the Eagles aren't playing, this story is going to continue to get legs and continue to get mm. attention because there's nothing else in the sports um, cycle for the Philadelphia Eagles right now until the draft. Then I think that will take over. Uh, Billy, I want to get your take. You know, you were a guy who played, what, wide receiver, and um, you saw the play in the Saints game, an egregious non-call, I would assume you would agree. But as a guy, you know, you know, you played the game and you see the way the officials are calling the game, do you want to see replay and more intricacies on these refs calling these plays, or do you think the game is already stalled and slowed enough? Wow, Mike, I can't believe you asked that because, uh, first off, I played wide receiver, I played quarterback, free safety, I punted, and I punt return, held extra points, kicked off. So I, I was kickoff returning on the hands team. So I played a little bit of everything. Um, when I saw that, I thought, wow, you know, it was bang, bang. It really was bang, bang. But, you know, I thought that there was enough people that saw it. The flag should have been thrown for, you know, the variety of reasons. Now, 
I had a different reaction afterwards. And I got my sons together because they both play sports. And I said to them, guys, I want you just to look at something. When I saw, and, and don't get me wrong, you know, anybody that saw me play or coach knows that I can be very, very competitive and be a lot different person when I'm competing than I am normally. When I looked at that, my first thought afterwards that the Saints focused too much on that. And what I mean by that is this. He, uh, the head coach, in, in my opinion, and, and of course Drew Brees was out there, but when you look at that combination, you look at you're the head coach, you're the guy that's setting the tempo. And I believe that because he was so focused on this play, he lost the focus on what he had to do, which was to try and win the football game. And he set the tempo. And then because of what he was doing, the team followed. And then his offense followed. And you know who else followed? The fans. The fans were going just as crazy in the stands, booing instead of cheering or instead of being engaged on what was going on at the end of the game and overtime. And I just told my boys that, listen, there's something that these are going to happen. It's sports. There's always going to be ups and downs. What you can't let it happen is to lose your focus on the ultimate goal. It's okay to complain. It's okay to bitch and all the other stuff. However, you've got to move on as fast as possible and use those emotions hmm. to do whatever it is the goal is. And I thought that for too long, um, you know, Coach Peyton, he just, he, he just focused on that, and the entire team and that entire stadium would not let that call go, and I think it impacted the outcome of what could have been their win anyway. Hey, real quick, let me sneak this in here. As somebody who played, knowing how much film guys watched, and it doesn't matter when you played, if you played back in the day or if you're playing right now, it's just a constant – ingestion of film all the time so you've seen a lot do you think that the officiating because I'm sure that you would notice that right and, and again I haven't been in a small position room of a meeting with wide receivers or linebackers going over film but if you're watching film and as well as on your own I'm sure that you might see a couple of times a bad call that would pop out is officiating noticeably worse or is it just We've added more cameras, like with Twitter. Humanity may not be worse because Twitter's around. We're just more observant of all the bad stuff. Yeah, I got to think that actually the officiating's got to be. I think personally, it's on a whole, it's better. I think there's more focus on it. I think you're getting, you know, more scrutiny. I think you're getting better at teaching. Um, I think it's just the fact that now, you know, there's so many cameras and there's so many angles and there's so much focus that things are just blown up way more out than they were, you know, 15 years ago, even 10 years ago. So in my opinion that the, you know, you're always going to have that little bit of, um, uh, you're always going to have that little bit of human error involved in the game. But I think on the whole, the officiating is better, but you got to remember the athletes are so much faster. There's so many things that are going on and I think, you know, and the rules are changing, you know, what we saw a couple of years ago, now all of a sudden, is a personal foul on the quarterback because you touched him in a wrong way, or you like I don't I hate the rule about the low because if you're coming in and you're kind of making a tackle, you know you know what do you have like a, a one foot by one foot area to hit the quarterback and everything else is off limits. I mean it's really tough when you're a 350 pound guy coming off the edge being blocked to hit the brakes and only hit a guy a certain area. That's really tough. So I just think that all these new rules combined with all the cameras. Combined with all the focus, I think it just is, is, is making us, uh, is giving the opportunity to scrutinize more. But I think on the whole, the officiating is better. Uh, unbelievable. Uh, Super Bowl 53 is just a week away. Last year at this Can't time, we were it. getting ready for Eagles and Patriots. And the Patriots being back. I mean, it just, the interesting part about this game, Billy, and we'll talk to you next week about this game a little deeper. But in 2002, these two teams played. It was an upset when the Patriots beat the Rams. Here we are, 17 years later. The Patriots are still going, and the Rams are back for the first time since. It just shows you how impressive this Patriots run has been. It's unbelievable. What, like four out of the last five years and, you know, nine years total? It's, it's, it's unbelievable. I mean, it's, it's absolutely unbelievable to think about what they're doing. I mean, it's incredible. And, um, you know, uh, it's 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 going to be exciting to talk about the next two weeks. 
I'm just completely astonished about what they're able to do um, year in and year out. And to get back uh, there, considering what they had to go through, um, I don't know if we'll ever see anything like it. And I think we are so used to it. It's almost like we don't. Like, I think we all appreciate it, but I don't think we appreciate the greatness of what they truly are doing and how great Tom Brady is, how great Bill Belichick is, and all those coaches and that, that organization. I mean, it, it really is something that, you know, I don't think it's ever been, I don't think it's ever been equaled. And I don't, I mean, maybe back in the day with like the, the Lakers with Will Chamberlain and all that stuff or with, uh, you know, with UCLA, but these type of runs nowadays are unheard of and i don't know if we'll ever see it again well think about it we were talking about the eagles have a super bowl hangover uh the patriots have had a hangover since 2002 it's unbelievable right exactly (laughs) right and you know every time right you're right and every time they get there they have an advantage because they have experience from the past you know where to stay what hours how you get access to the media so Every time they go, it's almost like it makes it easier for them the next time to win the football game because yeah. you're going against somebody who's never been in that atmosphere before. So that person has to play that much better or be that much better to beat an experienced team who says, hey, we've been to the Super Bowl yeah, four times in the last five years. What are you guys doing? Oh, your first time in 30 years? Okay, see you there. Mm. All right, uh, Oz, we'll, uh, we'll catch up with you next week to hey. get your perspective on the game. Thanks, Oz. Hey, Michael. Yes, we will do that. I just want to say one thing. I have a little pet peeve, and I don't know if any of your fans have seen this. You know, we talked about the Houston Rockets and, and the brand of basketball, but uh, James Harding and LaMarcus Aldridge on the free throw line, when an opposing team is on the free throw line, when that person goes to shoot, these two individuals make a movement to try and make the person miss. And I don't know if any of your callers have ever seen it, but I've watched it now for over a year, and I cannot believe that I haven't seen it tweeted about, and I Googled it. But these guys do this bush league thing to try and make the person miss as they're shooting the free throw. Check it out, and we'll talk about it, and I'm going to tweet something about it, and I'm going to show you a picture, and you'll know what I'm talking about. I'm a little crazy with those things, but you'll see what I'm talking about when you watch them. I will take a look at that because, no, I did not notice. What well, you're... Remember, there, there were a couple of guys. Patrick Ewing is one who comes to mind. I think they actually changed the rule because of Ewing where they would have a little hitch right before the ball would be released to kind of throw guys' timing off, and the opposite of that would be to try to draw them into the lane as a lane violation. You're exactly right. They weren't allowed to do that. Well, these guys – Markel Fultz tried low, it. Yeah, exactly. I don't know if you did it on purpose, right? Right, they right, right. They, yeah, they, they, they either step in or they'll use their hand and they'll jerk it up yep. real quick to try and get your vision to shoot the basketball. And I just thought to myself, I can't believe nobody's called them out on this. So I know your listeners are very good, and I'm curious if any of them have seen this before. And if not, I'm curious to get their thoughts. All right, Billy. We'll catch up uh, next week, pal. Thanks, Billy. You guys got it. Take care, you guys.